In today's Call of Duty Zombies lore video, I want to go over the entire timeline of the life of Eddie Richthofen so far. Unlike the versions of Ultimus and Primus Richthofens that we saw in the prior Etherverse, this Richthofen's life is largely shrouded in mystery at this point, but I plan to use plot points from Black Ops Cold War as well as Vanguard to help shed some light on his mysterious past, and use that information to figure out his plans for the future. This version of Richthofen is the only version left in existence as all prior versions were decimated from existence at the end of Tag Der Toten. This video does require you to already be somewhat familiar with the events of the Cold War Zombie storyline though, so if you aren't sure or need a refresher, you can check out the link in this video's description to watch my entire Cold War Zombie storyline video and come back to watch this video after. The story of Eddie truly begins back during the Ether storyline. He was a young and innocent boy living a relatively normal life in what was known as Dimension 2210, until one day he was visited by an older version of himself. This version of himself, who we know as Primus Richthofen, gained his trust so that he would lower his guard, allowing Primus Richthofen to take his life and place his soul within the summoning key. From there, Primus Richthofen would take the soul to the house in Agatha to be safe with Dr. Monty. However, unlike the other souls there, he was already an innocent child, preventing him from ever being transformed by Dr. Monty. Remember Remember this detail as it is important and we will return back to this much later in the video. There, he would meet Ludwig Maxis who introduced him to his young daughter, Samantha. The two became friends and spent most of their time playing with toys gifted to them by Monty. Interestingly, some of these toys seem to bear a resemblance to his other, older counterparts. Samantha described her father as introducing her to a new friend that just arrived, his name being Edward. She described him as being nice but not liking to share the toys. I didn't even get my turn. Another important detail is the timing of Eddie's arrival to the house. While during the events of the Giants, Richthofen pretends to place his own soul in the summoning key, by this time Eddie was already in the house alongside Samantha. This point, while seemingly minuscule, while the cycle was continuing, would prove to be the most important factor of Eddie's soul once the cycle was broken. During the cycle, the souls of Tank Dempsey, Takio Masaki, and Nikolai Belinsky would each be captured and sent to the house after Nikolai Nikolai's soul was captured. There, the souls would be transformed into children by Monty and met up with the others. They were all quick to befriend each other and all of the children would live in peace. However, this would be disrupted by the arrival of the Shadow Man and the Apothecan invasion of the universe. The Apothecans would be stopped and defeated once and for all by Primus, but sent to the Great War. However, when the cycle was broken, things went awry. He and Samantha still lived in relative peace until Primus Nikolai began his master plan to rid the universe of Element 115 and to solve the paradox of the multiverse. Monty soon found out that Primus and Maxis were working behind his back. Feeling that the children would be threatened by this, Maxis brought Eddie and Samantha into the basement, teleporting them out of Agatha and to Camp Edward before Monty devoured him. When they arrived, Samantha destroyed the facility in anger and promised to Eddie that they would fight the Great War and defeat Monty. Eddie and Samantha would accompany Primus and Ultimus to a forest, where they would celebrate their imminent victory against the nightmares of the ether. Eddie was also present when Nikolai asked Samantha for a favor to be the one to kill the one who perpetrated all of this. Secretly, Nikolai had poisoned the rest of his comrades knowing that their lives kept the multiverse together through the elemental shard. After using the Agathan device to destroy the summoning key and the multiverse in the process, Eddie would be present as Nikolai had Samantha mercy kill him with a welling. She then told him to look away as she did the deed. As the multiverse collapsed, the Agathan device presented the children with a way out of the dark ether, thanks to Nikolai, the way through. Eddie being in the house earlier than the other souls, this puts him in place to be one of the only two surviving characters at the end of Tag Der Toten and allows a Richthofen to live on past the end of the ether storyline. As he held hands with Samantha and walked through to the new universe, thanks to the sacrifice of our heroes, to begin new lives free of the cycle forever. The nature of events in Eddie's life from this point leading up to his appearance to the lead of Requiem are a bit of mystery, but we can make some strong educated guesses based upon what we know of him now. A lot of what I'm about to discuss are merely inferences, whilst likely very close to actuality, there may be some discrepancies. He, alongside Samantha, seemingly appeared in the Dark Ether story timeline in the 1960s, parallel to the date that Tag 
Totem took place. Sometime in 1965, for them, this transition to a new universe after Tag the Totem was seemingly instantaneous. We know that after Tag the Totem, this new universe was created from scratch. This is because Seraxis mentions to us in Vanguard that when the artifacts from the prior storyline arrived in the Dark Aether, such as the Mishu box, they learned of the outside world, and their first viewing of humans were Neanderthals. Eddie and Sam simply did not reappear in time until it was congruent with the year they'd left. Once Eddie did reappear, it seems likely that he and Samantha parted ways relatively early in their lives, as she mentions growing up in an orphanage in Germany alone. The orphanage she spent her time in, as well as the university she went to as a child, Heidelberg University in Germany, are both the same orphanage and university that the prior universes Richthofen went to. This thematic swap allows us to speculate that Eddie's early life could perhaps have been much like Samantha's in the prior universe. This would mean Eddie likely was adopted and grew up in a home with at least one parent, thus making him the only Richthofen to not grow up an orphan. These factors would result in this Eddie Richthofen becoming distinctively different than any prior incarnation, and now the only Richthofen left after Primus and Ultimus Richthofen were both wiped from existence after Tag the Toten. This family were also likely Americans considering the high rank that Eddie holds within the American government, and these positions largely being kept away from immigrants at the time. This can be interpreted due to the less Germanized and almost American accent that we hear from his distorted voice in the intel when he was interrogating Samantha. We know that Eddie is also fluent in Russian. From here, Eddie would grow up into a man, serving time in the military as a pilot known as the Blue Baron, a reference to the real-life pilot of the Red Baron, and the fact that Richthofen's representative colour has always been a blue. I told you before, their eyes should be blue. Using this to garner trust in the American government, he would find his way into the high-ranking position of Associate Deputy Director at the Department of Extra Regular Activities, a shadow subgroup under the Directorate of Science and Technology, specialising in Cladenstein sciences and the paranormal. It was likely around this point that Eddie also met the group who he is answering to throughout Cold War Zombies and who we believe to be the modern day incarnation of the Societe Occult. In meeting these people and working for the Department of Extra Regular Activities, Eddie would also manage to acquire various Dark Aether artifacts and journals from the era of Vanguard Zombies, and likely at least part of the Tome of Rituals as well. We know Eddie holds these objects by the time Requiem is formed as he places all of them in Requiem's archives and likely use the artifacts to create the technological field upgrades used in Cold War Zombies to harness their retrospective powers. At some point around this time, Eddie would also likely have met his wife. While we do not know much about her, we see both a wife and son featured in a photograph with Eddie on his desk at the end of Forsaken, so we know he must have been with her long enough to get married and have a child, a boy named Samuel. Potentially, Eddie gave his son this name in memory of Samuel Solinger, as some of the last words Eddie would have heard in the old multiverse would have been Ultimus Richthofen apologising to Stollinger as he and the other members of Victus faded away into the Dark Aether, the guilt of which may have haunted the young Eddie throughout his new life. This family that he would build during this time would prove to be a major driving force behind his actions from this point forward. Sometime after 1979, Samantha is contacted by Gregory Weaver. He has a target and needs intel from her to find them. This target was seemingly none other than Eddie himself. Although we don't know the reason as to why he was a target. It is worth noting at this point that in my earlier storyline video, I suggested the following events took place in Iran, since that is where Samantha and Weaver originally met. However, as new story information has come to light, and we have had time to dwell on it, it seems more likely that this is not the case, since we know that Samantha leaves Iran with Weaver, and presumably goes back to America in 1979, and this takes place after that. So, as we go forward, keep in mind that these events may actually actually have taken place on American soil. Samantha gives Weaver the intel on his location and informs him that the target's son will be out of the house and with his mother, giving Weaver the time he needs to accomplish his mission. Weaver goes to take out his target but something goes horribly wrong. Weaver, after believing he had succeeded in his assassination attempt, began to burn the house down behind him to cover his tracks. It was at this point, however, the failure in his intel was made clear to him. As he fled, he realised his intel was only half correct. The target's son was with his mother, but both of them were still inside the house. He ran to Samantha's apartment and spent
spend the rest of the night crying in his arms. Samantha says she expects this night will come back to haunt the both of them. If this target was indeed Eddie, it explains the scar along his throat you can see on his Cold War Zombies model, as well as the other injuries on his face, and also what happened to his wife and son. Maybe Eddie likely chose to use the knowledge of the Dark Aether that he had since he used to be in control of the Aether in the old Aether story, and he used this knowledge to save his son and sent him into the Dark Aether to manifest as an ethereal orb. <laughs> If Eddie didn't manage to do this, I wonder if Samantha could have maybe opened up a portal or a portal opened up in some other fashion, but that doesn't really make much sense. We don't know exactly how Samuel got into the Dark Aether. All we can do is speculate right now, but it does seem like he somehow got into there. We previously believed that his son may have been trapped inside an artifact, that being a rabbit named Mr. Peaks, who has replaced Samantha's teddy bear in the mystery box and also assisted us with rewards throughout Cold War Zombies and even on Shinonuma Re born. This rabbit named Mr. Peaks represents the promise to his son that he will rescue him and that Samuel will escape the Dark Aether based on an old Dark Aether saying from long ago. Well, 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 I can honestly say I never imagined being in this position. I mean, look at us, all body body. I'm not going to apologize for all the terrible things I have done because frankly, I'm not sorry for anything. Yeah. I've had the time of my life! <laughs> no, I know you'll probably never really trust me. And even now, you'll be expecting me to pull some last minute rabbit out of a hat. A big rabbit of betrayal. Yeah, no kidding. Thank you, Dennis. I knew I could rely on you. <sighs> so, do you have a rabbit of betrayal? If I'm honest, I've been expecting one since we all got together. Sadly, no. I am all out of rabbit. Ultimus Richtofen claimed he was all out of rabbits when he didn't have a last minute moment of betrayal in the ending of Tag the Toten, where they all had to die to reset the universe. The Forsaken is aware of this infamous saying that has clearly echoed throughout the Dark Aether. But all good things must come to an end. As the old Dark Aether saying goes, you're all out of rabbits. Was them or me? Do you know what that means? It means no more escapes. This time, no one gets out alive. Bye bye. Now it seems that Richtofen does indeed remember this, but this time he does have a rabbit in his hat. This rabbit could be the key to Samuel's survival, keeping him safe in a dark place, and the note describing this just so happens to be burnt, just as him and his mother apparently were. Mr. Peaks is described as living in the boy's hat, and we even see an emote showing Mr. Peaks being pulled from a hat. So this has to be a reference to the quotes from Ultimus Richtofen. So what exactly is Richtofen's grand scheme that he He's waiting to pull from the hat. And we know that Mr. Peaks has been described as keeping the boy safe in a dark place, that being the dark ether. So, here's the thing. What if the rabbit, Mr. Peaks, is actually Cortifex and Seraxis's child and not Eddie's son? Mr. Peaks is present in the mystery box in Vanguard Zombies well before the events of Black Ops Cold War and before Samuel seems to have been sent into the dark ether. This means that Mr. Peaks can't be anything to do with Samuel himself, although he might be keeping Samuel safe, it's not Samuel itself, it's not his Dark Aether artifacts like we previously thought, as it's been in the Dark Aether since Vanguard Zombies. This would be a big plot twist and would make a lot of sense. Two children, one from two Dark Aether entities, one human, keeping each other safe in the dark place. It would explain as to why the orb is attracted to the rabbit in the second Outbreak main quest, and it would also explain as to why the two are bonded together because they're both children, and even though one one is the child of a dark either entity, one is a human, they can bond over that childness that they both possess and that innocence and have more in common. And they both got abandoned. Just as Callus pointed out on Twitter, given Cortifex has an innate ability to transform the physical makeup of a living being into something else, such as the Decimator getting turned into a shield but still alive, he could have done something similar to his unwanted child and actually turned his son into the rabbit. As we do see that Mr. Peaks has 
actual teeth, he is ostensibly alive and he exists at the time of Vanguard Zombies. So like I said, it seems very possible that Mr. Peaks is or was Cortefex and Seraxis's child. As we know, Cortefex did something horrible to it, we just don't know exactly what. People thought he may have just killed it, but this could be what he actually did. Cortefex and Seraxis being a part of the royal bloodline and Cortefex committing patricide are very interesting facts. It not only implies that there were many Lords of the Dark Aether prior to Cortefex, but also that their clan may themselves have taken power from another. It seems like, during Black Ops Cold War, Eddie began to make moves to gain some semblance of control over the Dark Aether and find a way to restore his son to life. Whilst also getting back at those who hurt him the most, his plans begin to truly take form when the Cyclotron at Project End Station was reactivated by Valentina and the Omega Group. As the Dark Aether anomalies began to open around the planet, creating outbreaks and distorting the world around them, the US government scrambled to attempt to respond. Eddie took advantage of the situation and used his place in the DSNT to get into a meeting with high-ranking government officials and get them to place him as the director of Requiem. Requiem would be the CIA's way of combating the outbreaks worldwide. Eddie was given free reign to choose who would lead the departments of Requiem and he took this opportunity to set up his revenge on Weaver and Sam as well as chose the most talented people he could find. Weaver actually previously had a kill order against him by the CIA, part of Operation Crybdis, as they deemed him a national threat to security, but Eddie personally had this designation as an enemy combatant rescinded. Around the same time, operations at Requiem began. Eddie would also contact an agent of Omega Group, Dr. William Peck. He would offer Dr. Peck a safety net of being able to come back to the US and be given work, in exchange for becoming his mole at Omega Group. Eddie, however, used codenames this entire time, and Peck did not truly realise who he was until the end of our storyline in Forsaken. With the lead up to Firebase Z, Ravanov, seeing the increasing intensity of the experiments in Vietnam, knew he could no longer sit idly by. He made contact with Agent Baxis and began acting as a mole. He agreed to meet her at the outpost where he would be able to produce vital intelligence on Omega. Having been dark for months and knowing it was a risky operation, Sam decided to contact Weaver via telephone and inform him of what she was about to do. Unfortunately for her, this phone call would be exactly what would put her in harm's way. Being a Requiem phone line, the director heard every word and decided it was a perfect opportunity to advance his plan and inform Peck that Maxis would be arriving at the base. He, however, neglected to mention that Ravanov was her contact in Omega. The director would send orders to Peck under his code name, and a multitude of Peck's actions were motivated by orders from Eddie. He actually informed Peck of the weak dimensional veil at Kaysan to be the location of our post 25. The most major demand was to throw Samantha into the Dark Aether in Firebase Z rather than interrogate her as Krevchenko ordered. Peck did just as such, after first interrogating and torturing her. This implies that Eddie planned from the beginning for her to end up in the Dark Aether and gain the powers that she would eventually use to secure the defeat of the Forsaken. Around the time of Firebase Z, Carver had started to look into the director's identity, as he found him very suspicious and noted that he spoke Russian, keeping Weaver in the loop with whatever he found. Unbeknownst to him, the director was all too aware of his snooping. Following the events of Firebase C, on November 16th, 1984, meeting Ravenor face to face once again, the strike team successfully acquired the launch keys for the inversion missiles, changing the location to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, far out of harm's way. Just as they are preparing to leave, however, a legion of Tempests begin flying towards the silos through two colossal Dark Aether portals in the sky, joining together into one colossal tempest, incidentally blocking the silos with large Ethereum power node crystals. The strike team managed to defeat this giant tempest, in turn clearing the silo blockages and successfully launched the missiles. In the weeks following the event at Ruka, the strike team was cleared to return to active duty after almost facing a court martial only to be spared by the director of Requiem. Peck wasn't the only contact that Eddie had in Omega Group. Now knowing for sure from Peck's forsaken intel that that Eddie is the mole in Requiem, we can retake a look at the R cipher and get a much clearer context of this conversation. Translated, it says, Colonel, this threat is real. The entity hides in the darkest depths of the Dark Aether. It is waiting for its moment to enter our world and to consume it as it has its own. That is why it seeks to manipulate us because only we can let it in. Unless we stop it, it will be our end. I will reach out later. Requiem will have noticed my absence by now. This shows us that the contact who informed Kravchenko of the existence of the 
Forsaken was in fact Eddie himself. This information would cause Kravchenko's goal to pivot, and rather than simply seek to use the Dark Aether to control the world, he set his eyes directly on the Forsaken, and making sure to defeat him. This was the first part in Eddie's master plan of manipulating Omega Group, placing his pawns in his chess game. Once he had Kravchenko successfully obsessed with the existence of the Forsaken, he communicated more with Dr. Peck, and he had Peck, under the guise of speaking to Zykov, suggest the idea of capturing the Forsaken, rather than killing it. He even constructs the plans for the Forsaken containment chamber that Peck built for Omega Group, that just so happens to look like the mechanical Sophia within the prior Aetherverse. This communication between Peck and Kravchenko in the F cipher shows just how he did it. Colonel, we are going about this the wrong way. We shouldn't be trying to kill the Forsaken, we should be trying to capture it. Think about it. This could be the most powerful creature from their reality. It is an Elder God. It has power beyond anything we can comprehend. Who knows what could be gained from harvesting it. Zykov says he can help. All he wants from us is to break him free. We should act fast before Requiem takes him upon his offer. While Peck says that Zykov offered to help, and this may be somewhat true, the person who actually designed all the technology used to defeat and capture the Forsaken was Eddie himself. He simply had Peck say that it was Zykov to make Krevchenko go along with the plan much quicker. This would ultimately result in the capture of the Forsaken, and Requiem's soldiers taking the containment chamber back to Eddie and the US government. In the climax of Cold War Zombies, initially intended for July 4th of 1985, Kravchenko forced Peck to complete the amplifier and cyclotron an entire month sooner. Driven by his desire to please his superiors, realising Kravchenko's overwhelming egomania, Peck once again contacted the director, and finally makes a deal to secure his extraction to the West. In return, he would give Requiem the exact location and time of Zykov's extraction, as well as letting the director take the containment chamber. As I just stated a second ago, he now realised that this was the director's plan all along, and this was the moment he realised the identity of the director that I mentioned earlier in the video. Ravanov once again made contact with Weaver, informing him of Operation Is Bavatel. Unbeknownst to Weaver, the director was already aware of this thanks to Peck, but takes Ravanov's intel as a chance to independently verify the time and the location of this operation. With all his pieces now in play, the director was finally ready to proceed with Operation First Domino. With the Forsaken almost dead, he suddenly let out a burst of energy, almost killing the strike team and rapidly causing outbreak zones to appear across the world, this even causing the total collapse of the Euro Mountains outbreak zones into pure phase. Sam, knowing what she had to do, laments the director's most likely manipulative words that she's a good person before sacrificing herself by entering the anomaly at the Forsaken's core, defeating him but trapping herself in the Dark Aether in the process. With the Forsaken weakened enough, the containment chamber activated, absorbing the Forsaken and sealing him inside. As Requiem celebrated their victory, the director addressed the redacted board of directors and informed them that they have successfully captured the Forsaken, and that Maxis is now locked within the Dark Aether as he intended, meaning she is no longer a problem for Project Janus. The strike team were to be sent to Black Site 13 for indefinite containment, and Requiem was to be shut down, with this mysterious group's agents moving on Weaver, Strauss, Carver, and Gray. Shortly after this, the Requiem heads of department each find themselves arrested by military police and taken away, along with the strike team and Raptor 1, who are similarly apprehended. The director watches this unfold from his screens in his office. Everything went according to plan, picking his case up from his desk where we can see a photo of his past as an Air Force pilot and another with his wife and son, along with a familiar snow globe of Dr. Monty's house inside it. The director leaves his office, possibly for the last time. Eddie shut down Requiem to now proceed with the next phase of Project Janus. During the course of Cold War's onslaught maps, Eddie would also enlist one more member into the Department of Requiem. During the time that the Echelon facility became overrun with the undead, one SAA analyst named Eric Jaworski would survive the ordeal and make various theories about the events around him. He would report all of this to Requiem in case he did not survive the chaos. H. Meyer, Requiem Station's Berlin officer, would find Eric Jaworski alive and on the director's orders would send him to Requiem headquarters. From this we can see that Eric Jaworski's wife is truly missing, but we do not know what happened to her, nor if the communications from the Dark Aether were truly her or the Forsaken trying to manipulate him. What is of interest to note is that Eric would be placed under Carver in the Containment and Security Department, and is likely the person next to Carver in the Forsaken's ending cutscene, and we do not see him arrested. Perhaps the director still has plans for him, considering that he saw potential in him, but so far Eric 
Eric Jaworski has not reappeared in the story since Echelon. The director also spent a large amount of time in the later parts of Cold War's story with Samantha Maxis. It began when Grey had noted strange occurrences with Maxis after she had been rescued from the Dark Aether on Firebase Z, after which Requiem began experimenting on her while she wasn't allowed to be in the field, specifically in one instance a book moving. More importantly, having seen her photos about these events on the Requiem mainframe warns her that people above their pay grade can see them too. Weaver, disappointed in Grey for allowing Sam to get the better of her and enabling the events at Ruka, scolds her and warns her to never cross his path ever again. He also confronted Maxis and, after a heated exchange, confined her to her quarters with no more walks around the facility with her dog. Unfortunately, Grey's warning came too late. By this point, the director had already marked Sam down for special tests. Weaver received new orders from the director of Requiem and, on December 1st, had Maxis taken away for additional testing, based on reports from Grey about the high levels of Ethereum contamination in her bloodstream and changes on a cellular level. As she was taken away, Weaver promised to take care of her dog. On December 3rd, after two days of travel, Maxis arrived at Block 8, a classified facility of the CIA built with an Ethereum seal. She was maintained in isolation after she attempted to flee the facility upon arrival. Maxis was subjected to several interrogation sessions led by the director of Requiem to assess her powers. After 15 days, the director managed to push her by stating that nobody at Requiem was caring for her and that she was just a sad little lost girl. Filled with anger, Maxis used her telekinetic abilities to break the glass in her room. The director continued to torture Maxis over the next two months in an attempt to awaken her powers gained by the Dark Aether. This included forcing her to kill an Omega soldier with her mind, otherwise her closest, more than a friend Grey, would be shot. During one session, he threatened to shoot her dog if she didn't teleport her somewhere safe. At around this time, Carver begins doing more digging into the exact nature of the Dark Aether. Thanks to his military career, he was the first to recognise the parallel between the power structure in the Dark Aether and that of an army. His question though, who was the commander-in-chief? Carver found that very answer lying on the director's desk, confirming his worst fears. There was an exceptional powerful being at the top and it was growing in power, the Forsaken. Eddie's experimentations on Sam, in fact, mirrors the concept in the classic Aether storyline of Richtofen, also experimenting on young Samantha Maxis as a child. The difference this time, however, is that the experimentation seems to have ultimately been for her benefit. Eddie used threats against the life of her dog, not so fluffy, as well as Dr. Grey, her love interest in the storyline, to force Samantha's emotions to awaken her true abilities. While initially Samantha did not believe she had powers, Eddie seemed to already know what she was capable of. This, along with the fact that he was the one soul that Dr. Monty did not purify, as we mentioned at the beginning of this video, seems to suggest that he has complete memories of the events of the Aether storyline that he bore witness to, and are using her powers during the events of Black Ops 4 Zombies. This likely resulted in a lot of trauma in his early life and could be motivators for his actions. He even has memory of Samantha's birthday, whilst her memory on the prior multiverse is hazy. Samantha's initial reaction is that the director is evil and cruel, but by the time the experimentation slash manipulation was complete and she had better control of her powers, she was grateful to him. She felt that without him, she would never have realised that she was a good soul and would never have awakened her new abilities that would be key in the fight to come. This is clear Stockholm Syndrome. She would eventually use these powers to defeat the Forsaken and secure his capture, but trap herself deep in the Dark Aether as a consequence. Requiem would manage to destroy Omega Group and free the world from the clutches of the Dark Aether and the Forsaken, as well as accomplish many of Eddie's personal goals along the way. This leaves Eddie now in control of the Forsaken inside its containment chamber. Samantha trapped inside the Dark Aether, Weaver in prison with the rest of Requiem Department's leads, and the strike team contained in Black Site 13. We do not know where Black Site 13 is, but we can assume it is either in the facilities currently being constructed by him in West Virginia, or the point in the ocean that Peck points to in the final cutscene. It is important to note that it isn't necessarily implied to be a prison, but rather some sort of containment unit, perhaps due to the strike team's exposure to Ethereum. When Dr. Peck is trying to look for some old friends in the Pacific and get a boat from a fisherman, we do not know whether he is acting against or for the director. In my opinion, I do think that he's had a change of heart and is now working against the director in the five years in between Forsaken and in the 1990s where the storyline will then pick back up. Having been a mole for Eddie for quite some time, he will have extensive knowledge on what he is up to more than anyone. And after Eddie secures 
secured his safety, he may have started delving deeper into what Eddie is up to and uncovered some dark secrets. With his side goals accomplished and Samantha out of the way, Eddie was finally able to return his full focus to his current objective, Project Janus. In ancient Roman religion and myth, Janus is the god of beginnings, gateways, transitions, time, duality and endings, likely involving opening a large gateway to the dark ether. We do not know exactly what Project Janus entails, but what we do know is that he is currently digging underground tunnels in rural West Virginia, importing a lot of resources there, including 5,000 tons of steel as the first stages of his plan. They have been hiring scientists, military personnel, operations personnel and custodians. They used a cover story of a nuclear power plant tower failing and leaking to evacuate the locals. As predicted, a few locals weren't exactly keen on giving up their land, inserting their rights as American citizens to protect their property. They plan on starting construction on a giant wall. We can do a bit of guessing based on facts we know surrounding Janus and what Eddie is up to here, but I want to save a majority of Project Janus speculation for a separate video entirely and truly give it the time it deserves. Eddie has worked tirelessly throughout the storyline to make sure that Project Janus stays hidden from anyone who is not involved. One example can be seen here in the cipher from Strauss to Grey, where Strauss is making very sure that only Grey will see his communications and that she tells absolutely no one about it. Elizabeth, there is a new directive coming and I wanted you to hear it from me first. Perhaps it will spare you the initial shock when you are informed in person. There is a new project in development that will require a great deal of our Ethereum reserves. Unfortunately, this means that some of your research will be put on hold indefinitely. You are not the only one affected by this. I have been informed that half of all future Ethereum harvests recovered from my extraction rockets will also be diverted to this project. Now I want to leave you with a question. Be very careful who you mention this to. What do you know about Project Janus? For your eyes only, am I crystal clear? Another key example of just how far he is willing to go to keep Project Janus a secret is the story of the robot Klaus and the CIA agents in Berlin he interacted with in the lead up to Mauer der Toten. These CIA agents initially found a dead drop of documents not intended for them and these documents went into detail about Project Janus. The CIA agents initially thought it couldn't be real but their reactions to the documents provide the clearest look at Project Janus we get throughout the storyline. To Maya at Requiem offices on Tuesday. We recovered a communique this evening at one of our dead drops. I don't believe it was meant for us. It's addressed to the Office of Requiem and details a Project Janus. One, I don't know what an Office of Requiem is. I checked the mainframe but I don't have clearance. And this Project Janus, this can't be real, right? There's some pretty insane stuff in here. You are our guy at HQ. Can you look into this? What should we do here? From Rico. Eddie would in turn steal a robot that Dr. Grey had been working on, codenamed Klaus, and likely implant his own personality onto it as an AI in the same way the Requiem leads had their personalities implanted into the Cerberus Wonder Weapon. He would then make sure that Klaus handled the situation by sending him an encrypted instruction. From Requiem to Klaus. Subject, complete your mission. You have your orders. The security of Project Janus is your top priority. Contain the situation. Find and destroy the intercepted communique. Then tie up all loose ends. We cannot allow this to get out. The situation would end up resolved thanks to Klaus destroying whatever documents they found. And one by one, killing each CIA agent who had managed to learn of Project Janus, even if they believed it wasn't real. Realising that Valentina had betrayed him on February 2nd, 1985, in order to put a stop to her, Kravchenko decided to send in Requiem's Invincible Strike Team. After being held prisoner in Potsdam for several weeks, by using Raptor 1's life as leverage, who managed to survive the crash. Locating the Berlin End Station Lab, they realised Valentina is already within the Dark Ether. They activated Klaus and finished what the CIA agent started, retrieving the components to build an inversion warhead to close the gateway. So this was clearly already an intention of Project Janus anyways. Unfortunately, in order to properly purify the crystals, they would need a being made of concentrated ethereum. Luckily, a Valentina in a new form was just this. They fight and defeat Valentina, using her to complete the warhead and have Klaus enter the gateway to detonate the warhead from the other side. Kravchenko, bringing Raptor 1 out into the open, fires at the strike team, believing now is the time to tie up loose ends. The strike team are able to escape, though thanks to Agent Maxis, who, from her cell in Block 8, manifests a portal for them. The director watches this from his office, and notes that Project Janus can now proceed.
succeed, but Maxis's growing powers may be an issue for this. Which is why it's very likely that Eddie implanted his AI into Klaus so that he could handle the situation personally without him being there himself, but merely watching from his office close by. Even with this information, we cannot exactly say what Project Janus entails, but we can say it is likely that the plan is twofold. To satisfy the corporation he is working for, like I said, likely a modern day version of the Societe Occult, and make them think they are using the Dark Aether to their own personal advantage, while he secretly advances his own plans to save his son. Very little is currently known about this corporation. The one time we see their name mentioned in a document, it is redacted and censored out. We also know that Project Janus is very likely either a gateway or heavily dependent on one, considering that the corporation entity he is working with expressed dissatisfaction that he had Requiem close Valentina's gateway in Mauer de Toten, as well as the massive amounts of Ethereum seemingly required to accomplish it. He responded to the corporation by simply saying that this gateway would have allowed the escape of the Forsaken, and this would be awful for them because the world would surely fall to destruction, and the death of most people in the world would certainly disappoint their stockholders. He did, however, promise he would deliver what they wanted in time. It is very likely that this corporation and the Societe Occult are a modern story version of the classic Illuminati from the Ether storyline, as they are a mysterious organization that Eddie is working with to further his own goals whilst also taking advantage of them, using their mass wealth, connections, and assets to further his own agenda. Maybe his entire plan has been trying to rescue his son and in turn free the old ones who Zykov consumed to absorb their powers and become the Forsaken. We know they are returning just as the zealot Sparagmos, creator of the Chrysalax, prophesized after thanks to Eddie's nudging, we trapped him in the containment chamber and thus freed them. Eddie may have wanted to free them to try to contact Cortefex, who's likely probably going to be Zykov's first consumption in the final map in Vanguard Zombies, which is obviously a prequel to Cold War Zombies. And the reason for Eddie doing this could possibly be to trying to find a way to rescue his son through Mr. Peaks. Samantha describes the boy as feeling like they are scared but dangerous. Maybe Mr. Peaks helped us on the maps because he wanted us to free the old ones to potentially get back at Cortefex for trapping him, or maybe he's still loyal to him, or even unaware of what he did. But I think probably the former is more likely since Samantha has described him as being dangerous. He probably has it out for Cortefex. And the thing is, we know that Zykov consumes all of the old ones, but does that also include all of the old ones that we see in Vanguard Zombies that are obviously in the artifacts that are helping us? What this means is that Seraxis may also be freed and come back after the events of Black Ops Cold War Zombies in the 90s. And now that she has her memories back, what if she wants to rescue Mr. Peaks and she wants to rescue her child and maybe she could even be helping us in the events of the sequel to Cold War Zombies? Maybe some of the old ones may be against us, some of them might be trying to help us and they could kind of battle it out against each other. Other, but there's definitely going to be a weird dynamic there. The DG2 schematics that were left behind that we learn about on Shinonuma Reborn, despite direct orders from Von List, leader of the Nazi group Devarheit, is very convenient, almost as convenient as all Devarheit personnel vanishing mysteriously after blowing up Cortefex's temple in Egypt. Well, there may be people sabotaging Devarheit from the inside and they could potentially be members of the Societe Occult. The thing is, with Shinonuma, Trek has just retconned the Chaos story to be a part of the Dark Aether story, as Kraft is a big fan of fellow demonologist Alistair Rhodes, father of Scarlet Rhodes, who studied the Sentinel artifacts that created a stoppage in time where the zombie outbreaks would occur. On Ancient Evil, he was frozen in stone by Medusa, though. Maybe there's just a new version of him in the Dark Aether timeline, but the actual events of the Chaos story existed in one of the universes in the prior multiverse that got rebooted to a singular universe thanks to our heroes on Tag to Toten. Although, let's run with the idea that chaos could have actually happened in the Dark Aether timeline and not in the prior multiverse, well, the Societe Occult had a crisis during the 1920s, and the thing is, chaos was set in 1912. Could the crisis potentially be linked to the events of Medusa that probably transpire after Ancient Evil? Of which it seems like she was going to head to the Great Library of Alexandria next, which just so happens to be set in Egypt. It does feel very weird with the chaos story potentially being part of the Dark Aether story, but this could potentially work work, as Kalanin has pointed out on Twitter. The order in the Chaos story could potentially be the Societe Occult, which would be a huge retcon, but again, this is just a theory, this is not confirmed, but it has some interesting implications if true. But since the Chaos story has been retconned, what if the events of World War II Zombies also get retconned into the Dark 
Jackie the story, I could see Treyarch doing something like that. As far as the future goes, the most important things to watch for to find more of Eddie Richthofen's plan will be the way that the Elder Gods in Vanguard Zombies leave their artifacts, as they're probably going to get consumed by Zykov at some point, as Eddie will likely have to accomplish something similar to rescue Samuel, or maybe for Mr. Peak's Cortifex's and Seraxis's son to be rescued from the Dark Aether Rabbit too. The question is though, is the goal of Project Janus just to get his son Samuel back and also get revenge on those who crossed him, or is there more to it? Is there something more sinister? Was there potential plans for this even before his son potentially perished? We do not know for certain. As far as for now, we have to wait for Treyarch's next game to see the continuation of his plan, although we might have some more information in the final Vanguard Zombies DLC map. Of course, it's going to be all focused around the Construct and defeating Cortifex. We do have a quote from Vakana the Last saying, the Construct, I always hated that thing. It sits outside the natural order. Its motives unknowable to any of us. I cannot be certain, but it always seems like the Construct is trying to decide if life itself is worthy of existence. So we don't know what the Construct is or how it got into the Dark Aether. We know that Cortifex is very interested in it, and he doesn't even seem to know where it came from. And it seems to have been there since way before Cortifex was even a thing. And it seems like the Construct is actually charging up Cortifex, giving him his electric powers. But yeah, we don't know what the Construct is, but I'd imagine that Vanguard Zombies is setting up the idea of the Construct because it might be something that is touched upon within Treyarch's next game in COD 2024, Zombies. And maybe the Construct is going to be a plot point we'll see in that game too. Maybe Eddie Ritzhofen will be trying to harness its powers after Cortifex ends up not being able to do so. And as for now, we will have to wait for Treyarch's next game to see the continuation of his plan. I think it's important before we close out this video to summarize Eddie's personality. As a child, Eddie's personality is nothing substandard for a young boy, although he is a bit stubborn as noted by his unwillingness to share his toys with Samantha, and his insistence that Samantha doesn't know enough about zombies in the games they play. Eddie's personality as an adult is one of cold calculation, being just as manipulative as Primus and Ultimus Richthofen, though unlike them, he seemingly possesses no desire for recognition, and in fact goes out of his way to ensure people don't know who he is, indicating his ego may be somewhat more in check, while still being highly manipulative and scheming. Eddie does not seem to have any attachment to his subordinates at Requiem, as seen with his willingness to arrest the entirety of Requiem senior staff once he no longer has any use for them. Additionally, he is shown to take extreme measures in order to achieve the means he needs, purposefully putting others' lives at risk if he views the situation as requiring it, such as when he threatened to have Elizabeth Grey killed if Samantha Maxis didn't kill a captured Omega Group soldier with her powers. Eddie does, however, seem to at least love his family, as he keeps a picture of them at his desk. Along with Samantha, Eddie is the one and only survivor of the previous multiverse. Unlike Sam, Eddie seems to have retained some memory of prior events, as seen with the knowledge of Samantha's birth, as well as having a snow globe of Dr. Monty's house on his desk. I do want to give a huge thank you to the Call of Duty Zombies wiki, as some of the information in this video comes from the article on Edward Richtofen from there, that I will have linked to in this video's description. Like I said, I will be making a video going over more information about Project Janus and what we could see in Treyarch's next game in the future. But for now, that is everything. Thank you for watching the video, and I will talk to you within the next one.